Hey, what is up everyone? It is the Alpha J of the Alpha J Show and let's talk about reviewing Teen Titans Go. I usually like to keep my introductions less than 90 seconds to get into whatever I'm trying to do, but this one's more interesting and personal to me, so pardon a longer tangent. In a more meta sense, you could say that there are certain series that I come back to a lot. I would call those my flagship shows. SpongeBob, The Amazing Wit of Gumball, Fairly Odd Parents, and of course, Teen Titans Go. These are shows I started off with reviewing early and I stick to over the course of two years. I added Clarence, Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends, The Loud House to this list subtly. But I do want to highlight a few things. If I can separate these two groups, I would call one group the one that works, that I am passionate in, and the one that doesn't work that I'm also very passionate in. Note that I'm very passionate about both groups. I love talking about all the shows I mentioned and all the shows that I've ever made a video on, but a review of Spongebob will almost always do better than a review of Clarence, Foster's Home, or The Loud House. The same goes for Gumball, Fairly Odd Parents, and Teen Titans Go. So while they do work in terms of exposure and an easy way to make sure I keep up in terms of monthly views or whatnot, I am passionate about talking about it. You know what I am not really all excited to talk about that can get a lot of views? CV Universe, Gravity Falls, and usually the new terrible thing of the week. For historical context, let's say Big Mouth. I know there's a demand for it and I'll make videos on those as well provided there's a request for it or I am passionate about talking about it. I have requests for them as well and I will put in more requests now that I'm not throttled anymore by Review 75. The reason I'm saying all of this is because I want to be transparent. When I say I'm not going to stop reviewing Teen Titans Go either negatively or positively. Similar to how other reviewers may like reviewing the Powerpuff Girls Rick and Morty Spongebob, for better or for worse, Teen Titans Go is my thing. I've watched a lot of episodes, I've seen an entire community flip their lids because of it. I've seen lies manipulate thousands based off of it. It's probably the most interesting show in a meta sense that I've ever reviewed. I'm not sure if anything really comes close. To put it in very simple terms, think of a Venn diagram and on one side you have shows that are popular and get views, and on the other side you have shows that I'm passionate about. Only a few things fit in the middle like Spongebob, Gumball, Fairly Odd Parents, and Teen Titans Go. With Without passion, I can't make a ton of videos on it because it will feel uninspired, and without views it shows that a large portion of my subscribers simply don't care about the topic, which is okay. I'm well aware that I'm attracting a diverse group of people. So at the end, pretty much what I'm trying to say is the reason I wanted to do this specifically as Review 75 was because, like the 50th special, Teen Titans Go is something that has been grossly oversupplied in some areas and shockingly undersupplied in others. So let's get into it. A large majority of this list is season one. I cannot pull any miracles. Season three is the most prolific of the infamous Teen Titans Go episodes. And there seems to be a misconception that the downfall of Teen Titans Go started with the first episode. This is not true despite the handful of comments on my 50th special saying so. I know most are jokes, but I do know that some people actually believe that. Allow me to offer a counter argument with Starfire to Terrible. It starts out with Raven confused on why they aren't fighting Cinderblock because they can't can't. It's Motorcycle Monday. A lot of people don't like the fact that Teen Titans Go often use a buzzword here or a song there. And for this episode, I am with you. It's kind of random. It's very pointless, except at a few moments, but it's not on screen long enough for many people to really care. I do appreciate that they start off with an action sequence because in season one, they play up the whole superhero thing a lot more. The whole fight scene isn't really an action packed superhero standard fighting exposition battle, but Teen Titans Go is a comedy and for a comedy, this was more than enough. I'm sure if any other comedic show put in this effort, people wouldn't complain. As you can see, Robin is the only one fighting because Robin is the only one with the motorcycle. After beating down Cinderblock, he brags to his Titan teammates that he is the best superhero ever, but there is one thing he is missing. Arch enemies are status symbols in the hero world. Oh, I see. Why doesn't anyone want to kill me? <laughs> 
Starfire offers to become Robin's arch enemy despite her being ultra nice. She's becoming a villain essentially to make Robin happy. We go through Starfire finding the perfect evil laugh, the perfect evil clothes, the perfect evil henchman, and the perfect evil lair. I had more than 10 episodes to put on this list. I had more than 20 episodes to put on this list. And this could have been knocked back by many of them. The reason I put this on the list is because of intent. There is no bigger motive than Starfire putting her own interests and time aside to pretty much live out Robin's fantasy. In reality, it's like playing a game with someone despite you not liking the game, or listening to an artist your friend loves despite you thinking that the artist is pretty lame, or pretty much doing anything just to see another person happy and give them that needed enjoyment that no one else seems to do because you want to see them happy. It's happened to many of us, and I can't say because of the Motorcycle Monday thing is annoying that the entire episode is bad or mediocre. So Starfire enters Robin's room and tries to establish herself as someone that Robin should hate. Robin knowing how sweet and sensitive Starfire can be doesn't see her as a potential threat, let alone a potential arch nemesis. I could destroy a year's supply of your hair gel. Ah, you'd have to be a real sicko to do something like that. Also, I bet in a few months or so after this is released, there will be tons of comments describing which era Robin this is, so I'm just gonna leave the superhero division of my subscribers to describe this. Robin, the now hair gel-less leader of the team, tries to rally up the Titans in order to get them to fight Starfire the Terrible. However, they really don't believe in him. Sure, fine, go ahead, laugh now. <laughs> oh, oh, we are laughing now, man. <laughs> So Starfire enters the room, and the other Titans downplay her as a potential villain. However, this changes when Starfire literally blows up the moon. What really sold this episode to me is Starfire. Do you really care that much about your friends that you would blow up the moon to make a point? I will say that the other Titans really don't convey the correct emotion for blowing up the moon. The voice acting treats this as if Starfire dropped a spoon behind the stove, which in hindsight is actually pretty evil, possibly even more evil than blowing up the moon. Robin, who probably should be upset at the moon and hair gel thing, still finds time to gloat about his new arch enemy. This is the type of person Robin should have been. He leaned very close to being arrogant, but he never hit the mark, but he always could have hit the mark. However, in seasons 3 and 4, it's not even a team with a leader anymore. However, here, you can note that although Robin isn't really leading anything, which is very rarely a blessing like it is here, Robin shines in the episode and makes up for what the opening was. So they infiltrate Starfire's newly formed supervillain lair, and the Titans except Robin, who knew that Starfire had the capacity to blow up the moon, proceed to downplay the fact that maybe, if she had time to do that, her lair may be as deadly as it is. And it is, with both lasers and deathbots. Deathbots? When did she have the time to build deathbots? The better question would be, when did she have time to build lasers? Or when did she have time to blow up the moon? Or how are you speaking while fixed in one place and there's deadly lasers shooting in your direction? This last fight scene is actually pretty good. I like the transition of Robin fighting a mass robot army into cyborg shooting. The effect seems pretty cool to me for some odd reason. I do have some gripes about the fact that they use the same music a lot in the first season. Like for example, they use this transition passing scene music, which essentially was the instrumental for the I Like Pie music in Pie Bros. They ended up using that in a lot of other episodes, which is very weird when you think about any other show. Think about Spongebob for example, if they use the best day ever song as an instrumental in the production music for very low points where it doesn't really seem necessary. <laughs> Dudes, Starfire really hooked this place up, huh? That's so insightful. Now can you please help me with this robot that's trying to chop my head off? So those three titans get pushed into a piranha pool, and Starfire and Robin and Starfire's new henchmen stand off. Robin falls from silky vomit and... Just wanted to feel accepted. To be a real hero. But Robin, you are a real hero. I was wondering what day of the week it is. Hmm, I believe it is the Monday. You know what that means. Wheel punch! Ha <laughs> 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 ha, gotcha! 
And they say Teen Titans Go doesn't have its dramatic moments. Sure, when you compare it to the original show that was written to be dramatic, you would get a sense that this is missing something, but that's why you generally don't compare action shows to comedy shows. No matter how good it is, I wouldn't compare Milo's Murphy's Law to Avatar in terms of overall quality because they're trying two different things and doing good in those things. It's like comparing a spoon to a fork. Two different things. Both needed. Robin brings the Motorcycle Monday thing back and defeats Starfire for good. So as you can see, the episode in any way isn't bad. The story never seemed to pull things out of thin air or give justification to truly horrible non-plot action. Any evil actions was justified by the plot, and it never seemed mean, but more on the level of silly. The episode doesn't take itself seriously except at the end, which was a great touch. Starfire and Robin shine, and this is pretty much the beginning, so if you think you would like this episode, stick around, because there's more to come. Yeah, fade away, the way I feel for you, there ain't no word I can say. What I do for you in every single day, I make it through this game called life. It's always filled with pain and strife. Six episodes on this list touch on the topic of love, which is very weird for a comedy show. No, I'm not some hopeless romantic, and yes, I'm aware that one of my best performing videos is all about love. For some reason, when the writers deal with love, especially with two specific couples in the show that are not only together in many instances, also don't really have that many bad episodes together. The first of these couples is Cyborg and Jinx. This is not their first episode, but a very special episode all about them. Number nine is how about some effort? We start off with Jinx setting up the table for Valentine's Day. Cyborg enters the picture and one thing strikes right off the bat, but I want to see if you can pick up on it. Hi, honey. Don't forget to kiss the baby, Mr. Man. <laughs> Let me go! There's my little man. Come here, slugger. <laughs> this episode is completely detached from the show. I've seen this done in a lot of other shows. One that comes to mind is the tearjerker episode of American Dad, which takes what you know about the show and gives a very detached idea. Just how that episode worked, this episode does too, albeit in a different way. I love the gizmo bit. Unlike episodes in Spongebob like Pet Sitter Pat and Squid Baby, the person who's being taken care of is actually being taken care of. And although fights it in the beginning, seems to really love whatever is happening. It's not torture, it's actually playing 100% by the rules of the show and not subverting from it at all. In fact, they poke fun at the classroom environment card passing. Jinx, who initially wanted to spend Valentine's Day with her husband, is now spending that very special day with the entire Titans. I don't want to spoil a lot of the jokes, but these work to me because although Jinx only got one person a card and this is a Teen Titans Go episode, of course they would overreact. It also sets up Cyborg for not knowing exactly what Jinx wanted on this special day. You okay? Sorry about all that. We are here for you, sisters before the misters! Yeah, girls rule, boys drool and all that. The true comedy in this is that Tara Strong, the voice actress for Raven, said the exact opposite thing on Fairly Odd Parents, talking about how a world without women is great. This is great! A world without girls! I can do anything I want! Can we stop making Tara pick between the genders? We get more of Gizmo trying to talk his way out of this detached reality, before we cut to Cyborg in a bathtub with his friends crying because he doesn't understand why he made Jinx so mad. Never mind that an entire episode was made because Cyborg wanted to become a real boy so that he can enter a hot tub, remember, detached reality. They try to cheer up Cyborg with a makeover. Little do they know, Jinx barges in and watches Cyborg have fun. It's a misunderstanding, but due to the fact that he already messed up, this just makes it worse. What made me consider this as an episode for this list is the show that Teen Titans Go can make a plot that is in this vacuum in the universe that they made. Just because it doesn't make sense in the universe, Universe that they made doesn't mean that it's bad. Inconsistency is not a sin. I know a lot of my least favorite episodes have to do with the fact that it's inconsistent. Plus there's the creator paradox where if you change people will say that you decline due to never trying new things and that if you do change people will say that your decline was due to making said change. Not thinking that people could be just disinterested in the product. I mean this is season three after all. I did find an episode for each season except season four. Season four is terrible. Now that intentionally, but something I noticed upon making the list for this video. Jinx storms out of the room and Cyborg has a all is lost moment. 
You must journey to the land of last-minute Valentine's gifts. You must collect three magic cliched objects of love, flowers, chocolates, and a teddy bear. And along the way, you will need to display virtues of thoughtfulness, effort, and sacrifice. Thoughtfulness, effort, sacrifice, got it. It seems like Raven always has an answer in a book somewhere. Ironically, earlier in this season, another episode I reviewed in a triple versus spice game from Teen Titans Go featured Raven having a major plot moment by reading her answer from this book. Looks like season 3 could have used more spice. Lame. Okay, okay, how about this? To season 3 I say, how about some effort? 4 out of 10. <sighs> Look, it says film and animation as a category, not comedy. Anyway, Cyborg steps into a love paradise where he must go through these three tasks. Does this color look good on my petals? Is that the riddle? Sure, it looks fine. Let's go. Wow, I'm just saying it doesn't matter. No one cares what you look like. I just want to say that fine and no one cares are two totally different things, but the episode does play this completely straight. I would say that if this were season three, but it is. So if this was a bad season three episode, Cyborg would have simply pulled the stem without any second thought or first thought. My evidence? Not being the same character, but all Titans share the same ignorance trait. So look up in season one, the episode staff meeting. Robin decides not to follow the wisdom and instead take what he wants from the tree. The second task is getting chocolates, and since Jinx is the best, she deserves the best, which Cyborg arbitrarily picks out the quote-unquote highest one, even though if you're going with that, the inner cynic in me wants to know what's the difference between that one and this one. Also, if it's based on height, then wouldn't the birds be a better quality gift, considering that they're also moving targets, and thus more effort is exhausted? And none of this really matters, I'm really just taking the piss out of this. Then we get a third task, of sacrifice, which involves this bear. And all of these tasks are really the same, a little comedy, a little dialogue, a little struggle. It's really better than I'm making it out to be, but for the sake of brevity, this video is going to be long enough as it is. Let's move on. So Cyborg comes back to the teen ha oh. Oh. So Cyborg comes back to the Titan's Tower and gives Jinx the gifts because that's the key to everyone's heart. Even mine. Please send all of your gifts here, in, in this box right here. Just push them through the screen. Just trust me, it works. I have the special technology needed to transport what you push through the screen to me. All I want is you. All I want is you. All I want is you. <laughs> You've probably seen this all over Cartoon Network's channel ad spots. This is due to the marketing of Teen Titans Go, which I will not be going over in this video. However, they do stay together after the episode, and they were together before, and just like with Gumball and Penny, it's just a thing that happens in future episodes. So at the end, we realized that this was a giant experiment just to see what being a couple on Valentine's Day would be like. They don't like it, and there's a spongy kiss ending where everyone walks out of frame as if the shot ended in real life. This episode pretty much sums up how love generally works on this show if it isn't Robin and Starfire. They do take it somewhat seriously, and it really helps that the show that is wacky can pull off these moments to show that they aren't always cranked to a the atmosphere was very nice, and the story flowed naturally with no dead spots. So, let's move on. Can't fade away, the way I feel for you, there ain't no word I can say. What I do for you in every single day, I make it through this game called life. It's always filled with pain and strife. People generally say that Raven is the least annoying Titan out of the Teen Titans in Teen Titans Go, and I'm assuming it is because she always calls out the other Titans' actions. I don't agree mainly because if you've watched as many episodes as I have, she seems to be in on the mess just as much. I've reviewed a few before, Spice Game, The Fourth Wall, TV Night, and finally a lesson. Come to mind where she is no better than the rest of the Titans. However, in this episode, Neen, she is spot on for the most part. We start off with a reference to the other season 2 episode, Vegetables, with a meat party, but instead of a meat party, it is now a non-meat party. And yes, I have reviewed this episode before for it and I'll put the link to that review in the description below. Raven decides to end the party when she's offered non-meat and the other Titans bash her for not joining in on the fun. This non-meat party is not a party. It's stupid and derivative. You guys don't even like non-meat. 
Of course we don't. We're just being nice to Beast Boy. So you're lying to him. Oh, so Raven's not okay with lying, but she must be perfectly okay with withholding the truth. In the episode Laundry Day, she withholds the truth that she was the only one who manipulated the clothes into attacking her friends and herself. Heck, even in the first episode, Raven doesn't tell her friends that she made them go and get the sandwich as a dumb legend that even she didn't think was real in an effort to make them leave the Titan's Tower so she can watch Pretty Pegasus. It's kind of hard to stand on your pedestal and say that saying the opposite of truthful information is wrong when you don't even give the information at all. Besides the opening, everything else is fine. I just find the fact that she's being a total jerk for no reason to be stupid. Beast Boy is throwing a party. Did you think he was going to skip over you? Or are you like Eustace from Courage the Cowardly Dog and you just read with absolutely no peripheral vision? And it's not just a small snippet here, but also... Oh, but I do love the vegetarian chili. Ugh, if you love it so much, why don't you marry it? What a happy, happy life we will have together, dear chili. Oh, great. Now I have to be the mean one and explain to her why she can't marry a pot of chili. Or you can be the smart one and not use that type of language around an alien princess who already has problems with the English language. Like, for Bamboo's sake, you sung an entire song explaining to Starfire to not take everything so literally, and she even had problems after that. And that was in this season. Pretension doesn't always equal maturity, is my point. So Trigon, Raven's father, enters the picture, and they bicker like they always do. Why don't you want to destroy anything with your father anymore? Because I'm a nice person. Uh, I'm sorry, Raven, but you are mean. It's the half-demon in you. Maybe I'm not nice, but I'm not mean either. I'm mean. First you said you were nice, then you said maybe you're not nice, you're mean. Make up your mind. Trigon decides that since Raven wants to be nice, she will now always be nice to see what it's like. You'd think that because I had such a problem with this, the middle and end really do make up for it, and the answer is yes, absolutely, around this part to be specific. Beast Boy has another non-meat party and the other titans reject it until Beast Boy reaches Raven. And if you remember the spell, you know that she can't be mean. Night nice, Raven, at least this episode's version of it, is truly something to see. The simple visual cue of her changing her eye color is a nice touch, her inflections are a more subtle touch. I like how they also plant the seeds for Starfire's later romance here. They also keep the small touch of Cyborg appearing in the shot in a comedic way. Raven, obviously confused, decides to leave the situation after having participated in Beast Boy's party, something that meant the world to him. That implication is rather sad to think about. Well, what implication? Well, the implication that, according to Raven, it's better to disappoint someone with the truth than it is to make someone's day by participating in something the other person likes despite you not liking it. And if you're getting deja vu, that's because the situation is very similar to Starfire the Terrible number 10, pretty much what everything in that episode was about. We get a funny scene of Robin trying to give the pot of chili a hard time because the chili won Starfire's heart. I can't do this justice. So you think you can steal Starfire from me just by being delicious? Do you? Huh? Huh? Let's see how hot you can get. <laughs> Looks like you're starting to sweat. What'd you say? Come on, bro. Say it again. Say it to my face. This sounds like something Robin would do. So Raven is in her room trying to think of what could possibly be the reason that she is this way. Trigon appears and answers the question. Hey, I never said Teen Titans Go is a show where you have to think. I think a Rick and Morty copypasta beat me to any humor based on it though. Again, solid stuff here. I think the only thing of note is Raven's when you use the bathroom on a heated toilet seat face. It almost rivals the face that Mandy made in Attack of the Clowns. Almost. Plus, there is another really good Raven face coming up soon, and I don't want to just say that this one won without giving you guys the other one to compare. Trigon gives Raven a choice, either she's nice or either she's mean, and she can't be both. Raven says that she needs some time to think about this, and he leaves for now. I know Raven is pretty much cursed, but this next scene is really touching for a comedy show. She actually sits down and tells Robin a lot of nice things. Now, the curse never said that she'd be lying, it was only made clear that that she couldn't say mean things. Now granted, this might not be. Actually, I know this can't be Raven's first choice of words. Especially for a scenario where Robin is crying over Starfire marrying a pot of chili. But 
it is really touching nonetheless because there are thoughts that she had that she just wouldn't have said first, if that makes any sense. I'd like to interpret the curse as it's Raven having these thoughts in the back of her head but she doesn't say them because she believes it doesn't help. It does show that she now feels like she wants to be nice all the time, which they show in an albeit brief montage of Raven being nice. Trigon enters the picture again and he's mad because the curse that he used to make her do nice things appears to have backfired. Be nice or be mean. No more of this mean stuff. It's not a word. Wouldn't this mean that she chooses to be nice? So he takes the curse back, which apparently is a rainbow, and Raven does the old tug at something, only to make the other person exert so much force that the object inevitably blows up in their face, and so it does with Trigon. And according to this episode, this is permanent. The rest of the episode doesn't show that he turns into a nice person. He is nice, and it shows again later in the episode anyway. So we get to the wedding where Robin is visibly upset, and Raven now being her her mean self says that the wedding is dumb. That pretty much snaps everyone back to normal and Starfire calls off the wedding. This all comes back full circle with Trigon being nice to this chili, which at this point in the episode does anyone treat the pot of chili like a pot of chili. Anyway, this episode is really good. I do have some gripes with the beginning, but those are on the more minute details that rarely any other person who's watching this in a casual manner would ever think about. I love the concept because I can relate to it. I do think that you should have people in your life that could be mean, but they have the best intentions for you. Now, obviously, Raven isn't the best example of this, but I do think she does very well in this episode. For the brief periods that Trigon was in the picture, he was a pretty great comedic villain. The other characters did okay, and the whole detached from reality part with the chili didn't seem too stupid. It's silly, but silly isn't stupid. So if there was a way for me to describe this episode, I would call it good. Because it's good, but it has some areas where it's decent. However, let's move on to the next batch of episodes. These are episodes that I knew for a fact would be on the list. Can't fade away, the way I feel for you, there ain't no word I can say. What I do for you in every single day, I make it through this game called life. It's always filled with pain and strife. So you take a show that's pretty much known for doing very weird or wrong things to their characters and make an episode that goes out of its way to actually do something right and put two characters together in a believable manner. I said this before, but I want to reiterate it. There are two couples on this show that seem to be a thing, although sometimes one of those couples seem to kind of waver between one person and another. But like how about some effort, this is where Cyborg and Jinx seem to begin. It starts off at Jump City Bank. The Hive for causing terror and robbing the bank, and the Titans all watch instead of going directly into action, because what's a team without a little trash talk? And we see Cyborg fall in love with Jinx on the spot. The other Titans who aren't oblivious in this episode call Cyborg out for liking the other side of the superhero supervillain spectrum, but he denies all claims. Raven claims that Cyborg always fights Jinx when they go into battle, but there really isn't any other episode before this when this happens, unless they're just saying that just to say that. They go into another action scene. You know, I'm pointing out quite a bit of action scenes in the comedy show. You won't believe how many times I hear people, even in videos, claim that there isn't any action scenes at all, when a simple binge watch of season one can prove otherwise. Yes, this came from season one. And before you send me a link of a true superhero action sequence from superhero show A or Avatar or things of that nature, just ask yourself, is what I'm sending a comedy show or a story based show. So Cyborg doesn't really attack Jinx, but kind of hugs her and does a lot of different things and basically telling her that, well, he's in love. Great, she's going to get away. No, she's not gonna get away. <laughs> yeah, she got away. You let her go on purpose. Did not. Yeah, he's still gonna deny it. So this is Cyborg's episode and he really comes through here. Considering what's later down the list, you can consider this his best episode, even though some people may say otherwise. I like how every time we see from Cyborg's perspective, Jinx is happy or always trying to look good, but in reality has more of a crazed face and is trying to cause terror. What made me put this episode on the list besides the romance aspect and the self-awareness aspect is pretty much how they take a concept that anything can happen and anything can be spontaneous and use that in a way to forge this relationship that not only works but sticks through the next seasons. So Cyborg takes a photo of Jinx and prints it, getting caught because he was just a seat over. Jinx confronts him and he just gives her her favorite pie. <laughs> Blue 
blueberry pie. My favorite. I know. That's creepy. I know. Oh yeah, might I also add that they went the extra mile with the music here. Also, I find his sweat having a seizure thing to be funny. They kiss and it causes this electrocution. It could mean many things. I think the most obvious answer is sparks. They can literally feel the sparks in the kiss. Also because of the sparks and how Jinx's hair is messed up and the that and the loud noises and how they're smiling like that. It could also mean... Anyway, they know that this relationship couldn't be if the Hive or the Titans find out, so they decide to hide their affections. There's also a Teen Titans episode related to this, it's called Deception. I might talk about it at some point, maybe. It's one of the few episodes I remember watching a long time ago. But back to the episode, they decide to hide their affections, Jinx with Gizmo, and Cyborg with Robin, and it's pretty lighthearted. I'd much rather like to talk about the following. You would think that supervillains, at least in this show, would have no rules. Rules. The superheroes have tons of rules to follow, but supervillains don't, right? Why would a supervillain say no to letting a supervillain date another? I mean, the concept of evil is that it's the opposite of good, so the whole unity and harmony and rules of things can't apply, but it does. I mean, yeah, would it sabotage a mission because of the whole romantic attraction between the two opposing forces? Maybe, but at the same time, if one were evil and they had the upper meta self-awareness, they can easily do what Cyborg stated earlier in this episode and lure the other person into a false sense of mutual attraction and thus defeating them. But none of this needs to happen because the Titans in this show aren't really focused on fighting crime. So there is little that actually has to do with fighting villains, especially the Hive. There have been episodes after this in which the Titans and Hive are seen casually. And knowing this, this entire episode to me works perfectly fine without thinking of the superhero aspect of it. Yes, they're dating, but it doesn't really matter because the show isn't taking itself seriously. So this would be a benefit of not taking yourself seriously. You're allowed to do things outside of your more serious peers. I love your pink hair. I love your evil glare. You're bad for me, girl, but I just don't care, but I just don't care. They always give Cyborg this R&B inclined pop songs when he's singing, especially about Jinx. Also, I love the part about looking way too deep into the lyrics because it's the go-to when people don't actually want to think about what you said. I mean, there isn't a cartoon reviewing related non-criticism that lies in the darkest corner of every reviewer's eye. They finally get caught and still deny any claims of anything going on, even though they were caught. After having an embarrassingly fake fight over an ice cream cone, they're both forbidden from seeing each other. Some people may point out the lackluster backgrounds in their montages, and I do agree that they appear to not look like they take a lot of time, but Teen Titans Go! wasn't a show designed to have a lot of time put into their episodes, unfortunately. Jinx makes a big fuss, and Gizmo caves in, converting to good, so that Cyborg and Jinx can be together as per, I guess, the supervillain rules? However, the other Titans converted to evil, and they're pretty much back to where they started. They end up arguing and breaking up until... I guess this is goodbye. I guess so. Unless you were to rob that bank on 3rd Street next Tuesday, say, noonish? And with that, we've received more episodes with Cyborg and Jinx, and I cannot be any more grateful. This is one of the best episodes of Season 1 and Teen Titans Go. I know we have six more to go, but I just want to state for the record that for these seven episodes, I cannot really do them justice, especially to the portion of my audience that may be rebuttaling every point I give because they're in denial that a show like this could produce a good episode. So I highly implore you to watch this and how about some effort, because they're both really good episodes, and although they aren't like the shell or the matchmaker, I respect the episode for what it wanted to do. I love the simple story as well as the jokes that were in it. I think the Hive, Gizmo, and Jinx more specifically were really good as antagonists that aren't really meant to be taken too seriously. The whole thing felt natural and the opposite of what many people think an average season 1 episode is like. Yeah, fade away, the way I feel for you, there ain't no word I can say, what I do for you in every single single day i make it through this game called life it's always filled with pain and strife 
Finally, a lesson pokes fun at the criticisms that Teen Titans Go doesn't teach lessons. Many people raise the argument that Teen Titans Go doesn't teach lessons as well. Does it? Depending on the way you interpret it, maybe. But to say that Teen Titans Go has never taught a lesson is completely absurd. I present to you, Star Liar. It starts off with an annoying yell that because I had to go through it, you do as well. <laughs> Which was looped, obviously. They're preparing for a party over at the Titans East headquarters. This is from the first season, and as you know from Starfire to Terrible, and a couple entries going forward, season one retained a certain sense of playfulness instead of the meta spite that the seasons going forward tend to love to do in their episodes. You can clearly see with the way they're dancing, the way Beast Boy high fives nothing, and the way that they're being playfully obnoxious at the Titans East party from last year, that this is the case. I like that in the first season or two, they only mention it, whereas in the later seasons, the episode would have been about them being obnoxious and not caring because they believe they were the life of the party. Here, they have consequences that last for a significant amount of time before the episode is over, and they're forced to deal with them. Starfire, on the other hand, did get invited, which if you notice, she hasn't been in the episode yet nor in the flashback. There is also a side plot fart of Silky trying to eat. Don't worry, it's nothing like I was a teenage Gary, for example. Or at least I think. I have been invited. What? You got an invite? Guess you were the only one who got invited. I see. In that case, I shall inform the others that I am more well-liked than they are. Don't do that. Bragging is okay, but lying isn't, I see. If I do not tell them the truth, what other option is there? Um, it's called lying. Or withholding certain truths. That's a medium you can go down. It's like the cornerstone of a lot of companies, including YouTube. They might not be lying to you per se, but they are withholding information that sway you differently if you had the full picture. Let me give you an example. Let's say I took care of your pet while you were away at the Titans East dance party, and you came back and wanted to know if your pet was fine, and I said that your pet is lying down at the house. Little do you know, I didn't tell you that your pet was dead. Sure, I was telling the truth that your pet was lying down, but I I didn't tell you it was dead, leading you into a false sense of confidence. The best way to learn how to lie is by starting off small. Hello, cyborg! It is currently 76 degrees outside! Uh, okay. Hey, that's better acting than normal. But all jokes aside, as you see here, Beast Boy is going to teach Starfire how to lie. Which, if you infer from the episode's title, this is going to be the plot of the episode. He essentially tells her to wink after a lie to show that she's just kidding. So that she doesn't feel the guilt of thinking that lying is wrong. In exchange for this wealth of information, Beast Boy wants to be Starfire's plus one at the Titans East dance party. All of this is happening while Silky wants food. So Starfire ends up telling the other Titans that she's going to the movies with Beast Boy. The other Titans say that they're tagging along to Starfire not saying that the tickets are sold out. But uh, what do I know, you know? Ah, uh, looks like we just lied ourselves into a corner. And there is only one way out of the lie corner. Uh -huh. More lies. Notice how Beast Boy's face is not a face of acceptance or agreement or happiness, it's of bewilderment. He never gives off that he condones her actions and that's why this episode is on the list. Starfire goes in a completely different direction with what she wants to do. And all Beast Boy did was give her the tools. So while yes, he is in the wrong, Starfire amped it up to a degree that no one could have possibly known. But it gets worse. Starfire tells Cyborg that Raven thinks he chews too loudly, which isn't a lie if you've seen the first episode. It's pretty much the first scene of the first episode. I think that's pretty ironic, but let's say she didn't. Which she's Raven, so she probably thought so anyway. She tells Raven that Robin said that she was a slob. Which we've actually seen in Dog Hand. She actually kind of is. And Robin, being the leader that he is, wouldn't mind saying something if he didn't mind getting his face smashed in during the process. She also tells Robin that Cyborg said that he smells awful. Which is also actually true, but in a later episode, Matched where Cyborg does call out Robin for smelling bad. So yes, all of these are true, but for the story's sake, let's all pretend these were lies. We did it! No one wants to go to the movies! We are free to go to the party in secret! Hooray! Yeah, hooray. 
Again, Beast Boy isn't celebrating her actions. He's the one that's sad. That's why I like this episode. He isn't going along with it. He also tells her to stop at one point, but she continues. Also, you're probably wondering why I said earlier that the silky thing was a plot fart. Well, because essentially it's the same scene over and over with no true resolution or variation. It has an ending, anything could, but Silky eats, Silky eats, and Silky eats, and that's pretty much it. So let's talk about the more interesting part, which is the main plot. The Titans fight over the lies that Starfire spread. We can go to the biggest party of the year, or we can stay here and set everything straight. <laughs> Here, Beast Boy is happy, but Starfire isn't, which I think may be a miscommunication with the animators because based on how the story is going, she's not sad. In fact, the next scene would show just that. So after a fun time at the Titans East dance party, they come home to the Titans having an all out fight, which is more comedic than anything. Yes, this is an episode that did not start out with an action sequence, but it's had its comedic moments and ended with this here. Silky ends up exploding after eating too much, even though all Silky wanted was the can of tuna which was open the last time we saw it maybe this is another can i am ashamed i got so caught up in the lying i turned my friends against each other and forgot to care for my precious little bump orf. i do not deserve to be called a teen titan which is why i must quit the team it's okay we forgive you you do yeah you're being harder on yourself than we could ever be come on let's clean this place up i'm such a slob they then end on Starfire winking at the camera in a way to suggest that she's just kidding, but put that aside. Tell me what about this was bad. If any other show did this, it would be praised. It would be seen as a good or solid episode. So what makes this here different? It was a character getting caught in a web of lies that said character admits to. It's pretty much storytelling 101. I like the simplicity of it, and it took the story and gave it a natural way of getting out of control. That's what I like about this episode. It's natural. It's pretty much the way a story like this should go. I do have my gripes about the silky side plot fart, but that aside, this deserves to be on the list. Now, we are getting into the top 5 episodes of Teen Titans Go, and I want to say if you've made it this far, thank you for being open-minded. The next 5 episodes aren't just episodes that I think are really good, not just episodes I would recommend, but episodes I dare other content creators to make a negative review on, because to me, I feel like these episodes are so good that at most, I feel like I'd probably get like a this does an appeal to me subjective type of argument that could only suffice so much. Now am I saying you should think it's good full stop no, but I'm going to put up a damn good argument to why I think it's good. Now I have a ton of things to shout out so let's get through them. First and foremost I want to shout out Shadow Streak's video on what he likes about Teen Titans Go. It's a video not most people would make at the time and he also gives a lot of great points. The thumbnail is amazing in more ways than one and he shouted me out as well in that video so tag your it. I also want to shout out the one and only C.R. Martin's video on examining the cartoon community. It's a wonderful video that not only dives into the reviewing side of things, but also the atmosphere of the community as a whole. Another video you should check out is Gem Review's video on what traumatized him as a child. It's a neat video and he takes inspiration from Your Movie Sucks and creates value for our community. I also want to take the time out to shout out two more videos. One is from Twisted Dance. He made a video on Billy and Mandy. And if you didn't get your fill from my two videos, he made a fantastic video that's getting overlooked. Also, the Crimson Mayhem released a video on the subject of the Loud House and on the topic that's been simmered down around the show. So all of these five videos, links and all, will be in the description below and don't worry, I'll remind you about all of these at the end of the video as well. I also want to shout out my friend Damie, also known as Damienator Art, on Twitter for making this fantastic drawing of a meme photo that was me a while ago. I really do appreciate when people do this type of thing, so I just wanted to share this with you all. I also want to shout out Teeves for accepting such a big order of different avatar variations of me. If you've seen my thumbnails recently, they have changed from what they were before and these were all made by her. The links for both of those amazing artists will be in the description below. Lastly, I want to thank you guys for keeping by my side post Irma. I know at the time of recording this I haven't been posting too much and I don't know how I've been able to keep such a strong community but I will stick by your side and I'll continue to make content you guys love and keep pushing through this down period. So no more stuff. Let's get into the top five episodes of Teen Titans Go. Yeah, fade away. The way I feel for you, there ain't no word I can say. What I do for you in every single day. I make it through this game called life. It's always filled with pain and strife. 
So let's start off with the easiest to talk about of the five, Girls' Night Out. It's a great example of what Teen Titans Go! could do. It has all of the ingredients of a good casual comedy episode, so let's jump into it. Cyborg, Beast Boy, Robin are all getting ready for Boys' Night Out, and if you think this has something to do with Boys vs. Girls, another episode from Teen Titans Go!, that is not on this list. That was a terrible episode because it tries to do the whole Boys vs. Girls stick, but fails miserably, and takes twists and turns that it couldn't competently write for. The entire premise is built off of stupid stereotypes, and because every single time you see this, the boys are written to be stupid, but on a side note, has this ever been reversed? The girls think that they're better than the boys, and the boys end up winning. I don't remember seeing an episode where this happened, but I'm just throwing it out there don't hurt me. But getting back to the point, this is an episode that deals with the separation of genders or sexes, I'm not really sure anymore, and it does it correctly. Is this episode completely stereotype free? No, but the concept by itself is a bit of a cliche for it not to be. So Starfire wants to be a part of the boys night out, but since she's a girl, she really can't. This prompts her to create an impromptu girls night out with Raven. I love how Raven really didn't want anything to do with this. The boys unfazed leave for their boys night out and Raven leaves to have her evening of solitude. Starfire wants to know why she isn't enough of the crazy to join them on their night out. And she essentially says that the boys boils down to the fact that boys need to be boys around boys. So Starfire instead decides to take Raven out for a boys night out. You probably won't hear me talk a lot about the boys night out specifically. This is because it's more of a montage than anything else and I would just be explaining what's happening. It's random, it's silly, nothing truly remarkable but they manage to split it up in chunks so it doesn't really take up too much time compared to if it was all at once. This episode probably would be lower if not out of my list. So Starfire wants to help of the Hive member Jinx, who is currently locked up. I also do like how the heroes and villains do coexist here in this comedic take. I'm sure this wouldn't really happen this way in the original, but this isn't the original. It does make this entire vibe seem a lot more casual, and it opens up a lot of new opportunities for stories, which they do take with later episodes involving all three of these characters. They also opt for a cutaway gag. Here to gloat again about putting me in prison? <laughs> Look at you, you're in prison. I hate you. They do these often in season one specifically. In fact, Starfire the Terrible had a cutaway gag as well, so it's not new to the show. I do think that the background is quite bland and too still for the scene they're trying to work with. In fact, a lot of this screams, we're still learning, with the small things like Starfire's jagged eye movement or them not grasping the art of exposition shots without movement. The scene feels undone with so much focus on the people and mid-walking cycles. Maybe a different color choice might have taken away from this, but I'm no animator. Starfire is easily amused by the entertainer at the carnival fair place. However, Jinx remains unimpressed and Raven still remains apathetic. Another boys night out montage happens, they use the chibi designs, and we're back to Raven, Starfire, and Jinx. Their dynamic of optimism, pessimism, and realism really do contrast well. I'll get to exactly why this ranks so high in a second, but Jinx offers to make things much more exciting after a boring game of bumper cars and with her hands now free, they opt to ride the bumper cars around the pretty empty city, catching police attention. <laughs> time I ever rode a building. This is why the episode is ranked so high. If there's one thing that Teen Titans Go! aspires to be, it's fun. It wants to be silly and fun. And what's more fun than doing essentially what they're doing here? The music that accompanies this entire sequence isn't bad. This episode puts a lot of time into keeping the personalities of the characters. Raven, finally, after a riding a building, decides to have a little fun and show a little bit of happiness. They end up eating, taking photos, and having fun, which are common things that happen in a girl's night out. Just not to this degree. They put in the effort to be fun and it pays off. <laughs> What? Jeez, can she laugh without you getting all over a case? Ugh. 
Anyway, Jinx openly admits that she had fun with Raven following suit. Again, a nice moment that really ties the show together in a fun package that conveys the message that although they are a part of different allegiances, that both sides can admit to wanting to have fun. Their fun just so happens to be riding a bumper car, outrunning police, and hitting a building with enough force to throw it off of its foundation. I also like the small touch of Starfire combined with Jinx and Raven's blast destroying the walls of the prison instead of Starfire earlier. They pass by the boys who had their version of a crazy night, but the boys downplay it as lame. But they run away only to be chased by cops and do what they previously did on their girls' night out. Everything about this episode I love, aside from the boys' montage, which wasn't bad but just pales in comparison. It's a nice, simple, and fun episode. It gets straight to the point, and if any episode could come back in later seasons, I think it should be this. Because although it suffers with the inexperience of working together as a group on Teen Titans Go, it clearly makes up with the solid foundation for a story and the inclusion of a villain to show that they are more casual in this version of Teen Titans, opting to be more about fun instead of spite unlike episodes I've talked about before. So now with the easiest episode out of the way, we get into the good stuff. Can't fade away The way I feel for you There ain't no word I can say What I do for you in every single day I make it through this game called life It's always filled with pain and strife Rocks and Water might have been my top pick for this video. I love this episode. It is one of my favorites and I want to show you why. This episode gets straight to the point with Beast Boy and Raven talking about their past lovers, Terra and Aqua Lad, respectively. I like how they can cram a lot of information and comedy into the first minute of the episode. You have Beast Boy here overplaying a song that he wrote for Terra to the point where what he once had in his hands left him due to repetition. You'd think, and the last episode I just reviewed in his video would show, that Raven is a solid solitary person and she is. The thing about this is that Raven was distant around him, but he ended up impressing her in a previous episode. I love the fact that both of these characters do keep the continuity, which creates tons of opportunities for more stories. Beast Boy explains that he comes down to this place because of all the rocks. Now, in a previous episode, Raven did confirm that she had feelings for Beast Boy, and there are multiple episodes that support this claim, including BB Ray and Matched. However, this episode has a great twist on their relationship that honestly I cannot overlook especially because the end of one episode led to this episode and the end of that previous episode made this episode 200 times better because well I can't really reveal that at the moment but trust me if you don't watch Teen Titans Go this Raven Beast Boy and Terra Triangle it's actually a thing Raven here and Beast Boy talk about Terra causes Raven to yell at him saying that Terra tried to destroy all the Titans this would lead into Beast Boy becoming desperate wanting Raven to crush him with the rock the way that Terra would always do to Beast Boy and leave Terra messages on his Teen Titans tracker. Terra would rise out of nowhere and destroy all of them with a rock the same way that she used to do with Beast Boy. But that leaves me with a good question. In the previous episode that involved Beast Boy and Terra, Raven sucked them both into a garbage pit via a portal. The episode never explains how Beast Boy or Terra got out, which from the last episode, there was a way and that way was a rope from the other person on the other end helping you out. However, they never show this in this episode. So the way that she got out is that they also have dark magic powers and between Beast Boy and Terra one of them summoned a portal to get out. I mean it's the only logical way. What I want is for you to leave me alone. 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 I've met someone. See she has a boyfriend move on. Thanks Raven. Oh I think you might know him. So they all freak out because no one would expect these two to date. Beast Boy goes crazy the same way that he went crazy in the previous episode, Pirates. Another from season two like this, where Raven and Aqualad initially fell for each other. Which brings this back into the humorous and cartoonish atmosphere that the show really wants to be in. I also like how they brought back the pirate gimmick, that Aqualad was a pirate because in the previous episode, Pirates, he was not a pirate in the beginning, he was more of a smooth talker and towards the end, then he became a pirate but nothing else occurred until now. They even use the same music and Cyborg even has the same reaction. It could literally be the same vocal reaction because the show loves to reuse certain vocal clips, but I'm not really sure. You two have nothing in common. Yeah, he's about water, she's about rocks. He's a hero, she's a villain. He's a boy, she's a girl. Nothing in common! Cyborg is a girl, confirmed. When you rejected me, I was heartbroken. 
But seeing you now, sad, alone, and single, I know I dodged a bullet. I am not single. Uh, Beast Boy and I are dating. Really? Really? The really? That's cool. Beast Boy's reaction always gets me. But that's pretty much the plot right there. Raven and Beast Boy are temporarily together in order to spite their former lovers. Aqua Lad offers a double date, calling their bluff on the spot. And Robin makes it a triple date by adding himself and Starfire. Now you might or might not be wondering why I didn't mention Starfire and Robin as a couple. And this is because they aren't. Sure, there were times where maybe they could, but no. A lot of times, this is a tease, so I don't really count that. I feel as though the writers don't have any interest in putting them together, so I don't pay attention to that aspect anymore. Now, will Cyborg make it a quadruple date? Filling the date night with a whole bunch of shenanigans that leads into an epic battle? No, he goes as a third wheel. You have to have some comedy somewhere. This leads into the scene, which is one of my favorites in the episode. Teen Titans Go! isn't a show for long, drawn-out drama, but when they do, and go out of their way... Ha! Psh. You were telling me to get over Terra, and you still want to do the smoochy smoochies mwah, 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 with Fish Face. Blah. Well, maybe I made a mistake dumping him. Well, I'm glad you did, though, because I got a date out of it. It's a fake date. We're just trying to make them jealous. Oh, that's dirty. I like your style, Mama. Come here. <laughs> They excel. Everything about this exchange of dialogue is perfect. I wouldn't change a single thing. They kept the comedy of Cyborg and Robin and Starfire out of it. They focused on the right and relevant things to say. Plus, there's something amazing about doing all of this in a car. Also, I like how when they get to this place, they pretty much have the same face as the ones they did when Beast Boy took one hand off the wheel. So they set up this sequence quite effectively. They put the comedy on one side and the story on the other. Beast Boy and Raven are with Aqualad and Terra at one table, and Cyborg, Robin, and Starfire are at another. Your makeup looks great today. Yeah, really? thanks. You're a beautiful young lady. Wow, you, um, look nice. And I am enjoying the color of your yes. cloak. Nail or, uh -huh. wow, like look at your hair. Feet. They're so cute. You're so hairy. Oh, I love your eyes. Thank you. And like your cloak you. matches your hair yeah. perfectly. I like you a lot. Why, thank but, you. Yeah. Maybe we should hug or kiss sometime. Yeah, and go around. That's pretty much how I talk to myself in the mirror. By the way, I ordered for the table. Ooh, I love calamari. Mr. Belvedere, is that you? It is! You're eating the squid that raised me as a child! How could you, Terra? Now, how in a Neptune was she supposed to know? I also love how you're mad at the person who's eating the squid, but you're not mad at the person who caught it, the person who cooked it, the person who served it, or the person who ordered it. Do you have, like, algae for brains? Terra reacts calmly and apologizes for any misunderstanding, which makes them stronger as a couple. Also note that although Raven was telling Beast Boy in the beginning to get over his love for Terra, Raven here is the one initiating all of the fighting with Aqualad and Terra. The next scene shows shows this when they mess with Aqua Lad during his underwater symphony. The third wheel running gag is what it is. Insert Lady in the Tramp spaghetti reference here. And those colors will haunt my corneas. And we get to this symphony. In Pirates, Aqua Lad did this exact same thing for Raven. Is that his one trick? He brings girls down here and shows them this symphony? Dude, you're a one trick sea pony. So Raven ends up crushing this octopus with the rock. She also changes Aqua Lad's photo of Terra into a fish. Although there's something off about this. I think I need to contact someone with a PhD in animation to give a more thorough analysis. Th this ain't a girl though. If you look at this face long enough, that is a fucking dude. I guess Cyborg was wrong. Maybe they have a lot more in common than we know. Also like how a lot of this is Aqualad messing up. There is a lack of balance in terms of who is messing up things for who. But I guess it's fine because it yields the same result either way. They get to a boiling point and break up, leaving Beast Boy and Raven satisfied. <laughs> Nice. We should have known. Guys, not a good time.
that's pretty much me when I wake up from a good dream. But now they go into this semi-action sequence in which they get dumped into the trash hole again. It's okay, Terra, just use the same way you got out last time. Remember? Anyway, more teasing for a kiss and a third wheel joke, and that's pretty much rocks and water. I think it's a funny, charming, and entertaining episode. It had a great deal of surprise. I love the direction it took. It shows that these characters can have a great episode without resorting to changing their art style or bringing in another series. Yeah, fade away. The way I feel for you, there ain't no word I can say. What I do for you in every single day. I make it through this game called life. It's always filled with pain and strife. So you know how an episode of Reviewed in this video opposites pretty much talked about the relationship between Cyborg and Jinx? Well, this episode comes before that, even though it aired after Opposites. This episode comes before that chronologically. Well, what makes this better than Rocks and Water? Well, you'll see. The episode follows the end of Terror Eyes, an episode from season 1 like this, in which tension between Raven and Terra gets to an all-time high, and Raven banishes her to a dimension of trash. Since then, Terra has been plotting on how to get her revenge on the titans. Cyborg empties his pot of food in the portal and then throws the pot out because the animators had absolutely no way to have Cyborg put down the pot. I mean in many cartoons what they do when they want to get rid of an object without putting the effort to actually putting it down is simply cutting to a close shot of the other character talking and then when they cut back out, in this case, Cyborg would not have the pot anymore. You've seen this in tons of cartoons, especially when the character is wet or covered in something or just not in their normal model. Raven would explain that she basically put Terra in a garbage dimension. We also get the exposition and context for this episode. Essentially it's Valentine's Day and Starfire is setting up an event where everyone can come with the partner of their choosing. Robin obviously asks Starfire in a very comedic way. I love this side of Robin, not the controlling or blatantly ignorant kind. Here he's used for comedy, even if it is at the expense of teasing us with another Starfire Robin-esque episode. Cyborg in this episode episode can't be with Jinx because she's still arrested. I don't know whether this is genius because it follows the continuity set in Girls Night Out or unfortunate because we miss out on a true episode in season one that could have covered maybe all three relationship couple love triangle whatevers. I also loved how when Cyborg slipped, the animation as seamless as it was transformed him and blasted him out of the situation. It's way funnier than I can ever explain. So Beast Boy gets the idea of helping Terra escape, which if you remember from the previous episode, rocks and water, Terra was in another dimension. The way she gets out here is when Raven creates a portal, Beast Boy with the rope helps her out. So how did they get out in the previous episode? Because Beast Boy was also in the portal with Terra. No one is sure. However, Terra sinisterly agrees to take Beast Boy out on his offer to go to whatever Valentine's event that it is. If it appears that I sound really uninterested in the event itself, Teen Titans Go has holiday episodes and all of them are really the same. In fact, in fact, you could have easily done this exact same episode for New Year's Day and just tweak the holiday tropes or cliches that you would end up using. Ah, uh, how cute, Star. You're really getting into- Ow! It's shooting me! Ah! It's shooting me! Whose baby is that? It is not a baby. It is the Cupid. Now, if the show had a lot of this comedy, I don't think many people would be complaining. It's innocent, it's fair, it's not full of spite or being meta or trying to grab your attention due to controversy. So Beast Boy already blabs out that he's taking Terra, and Raven, like she did in Terrorize, keeps an eye on Terra. She even claims that she's doing this to protect the Titans. However, in this episode, and many others, even if this was the case, she has clear secondary motivations. In fact, side note, does anyone ever wonder how the point of view for this spying is possible without Terra seeing? Is it an invisible camera? Am I the only one? So we get Terra attempting to open this door, which is funny because if the door is that hard to open, you would think she'd do some other strategy. I think it would have been funny just to see her on loop, trying this one idea that clearly isn't working. And I might hate myself, but she's really stuck between a rock and a hard place. She would have had to do this for rock god knows how long, or get help from Meast Boy, which is the option she's forced to choose. We get more comedy from Starfire and Robin, and if there's any reason to watch this episode, it's for the comedy. I know I hammered this home, but Teen Titans Go is intended to be a comedy, so I want to make sure what they do best, or worst, is what I give you guys. And seeing how this is a top 10 best video, my mood is more giving you guys what is the best about this episode, as the forefront. Not the entirety, but the forefront of this review. There is bad stuff about this episode, and bad stuff about all the other episodes in this entry, and I've said them, but it comes much later for this episode. So 
so don't worry. So we get a very important scene in this episode that I don't want to rush over. Beast Boy brags to Raven that Terra is getting him a gift. Raven, without any sense of spite or anger, tells Beast Boy that Terra is trying to destroy the Titans. Her face does not read anger or sarcasm or any form of negativity that she would usually spew. Raven admits to spying on her again, but what happens here is truly remarkable. Now he'll learn just how much I care for him. See? Care to crush him! She doesn't really mean that. I hate Beast Boy! <laughs> what a jokester she is. Hate! She gets grumpy when she hasn't eaten. Hate, 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 hate! <sighs> I tried to warn you. You okay? <laughs> What's wrong with me? There's a good side to her, Rave. I know it. I'm just not good enough for her. You know, there's another girl out there who I bet likes you. If she's out there, why hasn't she told me? That's why this is one of the top three best episodes of Teen Titans Go. You have this dynamic of one person bragging about this terrible person, but in their eyes, because they have deluded themselves into thinking that they're in an amazing relationship because of how the other Titans, aside from Raven, have been so unironically supporting, they have finally embraced that maybe what they thought they had is not there, but still choose to believe it, even when the person in question, Tara if you're following this, without prior knowledge of being recorded or watched admitted with the utmost honesty that she hates Beast Boy. Raven who very well may be primarily doing this to protect the Titans cannot deny that there's another motive that she has between being jealous that Beast Boy is the way he is towards Terra or that she likes him so much that she cannot stand to see Beast Boy inevitably being hurt. Maybe she has no regard for the Titans and she's only doing this for Beast Boy but because she hides herself in her own misery we won't ever know. Yes this is this is all from a Teen Titans Go! episode. No, I'm gonna need you to get back here. What dance is that? Flight of the Friend Zone? What back page subreddit did you get this from? And I hope you took your upvote back. Why are you pushing your nasty armpit smell onto everyone else? Get, get, get back. I just hit my hand on the keyboard. You see what you did, Robin? I just wanted to. Ah! Ow! She's all tied up! Ow! Why? Step away from the prisoner! Yeah, the joke is pretty much talk, get shocked, talked, get shocked, and you see it from a mile away. It was honestly kind of unnecessary and underwhelming for such a trans episode. Making up words here, the prefix trans meaning between, between episodes, continuity build, whether intentional or unintentional. It gets to a high point where both Starfire considers Robin, quote, like a brother, and Raven is just about to admit her feelings. But Tara makes it back into the picture. They have a short fight, really similar to the previous episode Rocks and Water, where pretty much the exact same thing happens, just with Raven's fist and not Beast Boy's. Between this is a song here that you probably have gotten sick of during the transition. By your side is where I'll be, endless love on pay you'll see, uh, when I walk you walk with me, Tara, uh, together let the light shine. We also get a close up of Raven's face looking really sad, but the episode ends with Beast Boy jumping into this garbage dimension to not lose Terra again and... Beast Boy, I didn't get to tell you how I feel. This episode, it's honestly amazing. I would not be surprised if it ends up on my top 20 best episodes I reviewed this year that comes out in January. I love the cliffhanger that it ends on. I love that this episode has substance. The foundation at its core is solid and works tremendously. So what can possibly be better than this? Easy. Can't fade away The way I feel for you There ain't no word I can say What I do for you in every single day I make it through this game called life It's always filled with pain and strife La Lava de Amor is one of the best episodes of Teen Titans Go. I know it's a joke to say that a good episode of Teen Titans Go wouldn't feature the Teen Titans in an episode, but to be completely honest, that realization came after making the list. What drives La Lava de Amor to the top of my list is the philosophy of how I organize a top 10 or top whatever list. I try to see what the show intends or what it represents and try to find an episode that fits that said criteria. I will go into more of what I gathered in the number one pick. 
but know this. La Larva de Amor is one of the best random episodes of any show that I've ever seen. Let me explain. When I say random, yes I mean detached from reality, yes I mean unpredictable, but I also mean a premise that really cannot work outside of the context that it needs. An alien worm sails across a great sea and finds and woos a Hispanic woman, which leads to a fight with their past lover in their expensive house. This is honestly one of my favorite episodes besides Rocks and Water, and those two episodes I thought were going to be one and two, but there's still one more episode that honestly defines what Teen Titans Go is, but also does it in a way that's more entertaining and more lasting. But let's continue here. This episode starts off with a very comedic milk mustache showdown. For the 800th time, why they couldn't just go with this for their comedic take on episodes is way beyond me. Starfire is going away, and the Titans must watch Silky. If you focus on Silky, you'll see that he, I think, let's go with he if I'm wrong, I'm wrong, he is already on the move. The other Titans are still pre occupied with the game, especially when Beast Boy brings out a clearly expired milk that is pretty much solid and thus easier to make incredible mustaches with. However, during the chaos, this happens. All's fair. <laughs> <laughs> You also notice that Beast Boy didn't change his expression for a long time, which if you watch a lot of season one, maybe season two, they actually didn't have too much of a budget. But I can't imagine for season three and season four, they had the same problem. If so, again, like I said in one of my Teen Titans Go videos, Cartoon Network is grasping onto you. You should be able to leverage your contract for more money because without Teen Titans Go and Cartoon Network size at least, they think they're screwed. It's like SpongeBob with Nickelodeon. You know you can walk, right? So Robin notices that Silky is gone, and they go off to search for him. We start off with Robin searching Starfire's room, and they layer this with a lot of small gags. These gags consisting of Robin scribbling, I heart Robin on a poster of Starfire's, as well as Robin keeping Starfire's secret book, and... Oh. Silky is then shown outside of the tower. If it's that easy to get into the tower, then how come a Hive member just can't go up the elevator and no rush into Titans? Is that... Is that too far? Now it's just a montage of everyone searching for Silky and Silky letting life take him wherever life wants to, ending up at sea like I said earlier. The thing is Silky fluctuates between being sentient and capable of higher thought to crawl, worm, crawl, silk. Is he actually controlling what is happening? Has he done this before? Well, from what I can see from the rest of this episode, he is more of the crawl, worm, crawl type of mindset. And if you don't know what that means, I'm saying that he's dumb as a brick. But that does not take away from this episode at all. We also get Batman not laughing. I guess no one told him the joke that he's on Teen Titans Go. You know that's the reason he's always laughing, right? Beast Boy, because he's Beast Boy, ends up eating in the midst of his search. They go outside to find Silky instead. It's pretty much the same luck as in no luck at all, as Silky is not even on the same patch of land anymore. Um, excuse me, what is that parasite crawling up your leg? If you're that shiny, you'd be deep fried Sonia right now. Just saying. I am Sonia Concheta Hernandez. And you are? I'm the Alpha J of the Alpha J Show. How are you? I'm fine. I just got done recording. I was just talking about how I was going to. <clears throat> Do not speak. Your eyes speak for you. I can tell someone like you. And how you're to holding me. No woman, consent. No? You would never tell her her dress was too short or call her mother a donkey. You are so different from my ex fiance Carlos. You know how to really listen. He would not like me talking to you. And why are you holding me? And he's right there, isn't he? So they have exhausted their efforts until Cyborg finds this. Loving the slight fourth wall break right there. However, this is merely a shedded skin sack that Cyborg drops on the couch. So we get somewhat of an ambiguous relationship. Is this like a pet relationship, a kid relationship, an actual couple? It seems, for me at least, to hit somewhere between the three. You wouldn't dance with your pet in that way without PETA all over you. You wouldn't feed your significant other tacos like that. 
And you wouldn't, in the most whispery and seductive voice, ever tell your child that you like the way they dance. But this works in Teen Titans Go's favor because this makes it clear that you can interpret this any way you'd like and still be right, in a sense. So her former lover comes into the picture, and Silky, who is just going with the flow, gets jailed. I would rather die in your arms than live one day with a bad man. Yes, my love, hurry! Yeah, they are playing this up for you to think that this is something real, but it's not. And it only appears to be taking itself seriously. But nothing in this episode really shows me that Silky is in any real danger. It never feels that Silky's unhappy, but just responding to the environment and the factors around him. In fact, they do a creative job making Silky win with just doing what he does best, worming and crawling. So Silky approaches the bad man Carlos, if it wasn't obvious, parodying soap opera antagonists, and is voiced by the same person who voices Robin. When they fight, it is clear that this isn't a true battle, because again they don't take themselves seriously, and do this in a way that shows that they're just having fun with the scenarios that they make up. I love everything that this episode represents. It's full of references, it has a lot of elements that spoof soap operas, so Silphy has to let Silky get back home. It's sad, not touching, but a kind of sad scene. We then find Starfire is back, but they don't know where Silky is, so after a few more tries to stall for time, Time, this happens. Well, we have the big problem. I trusted you. And that was La Larva de Amor, an incredible episode that honestly, in the category of being criminally underrated, there is little to not like, except that more episodes like this aren't made, but they made two TV nights. And don't worry, I may get back to TV night two, like I did with TV night, but let's not stall. I know you want to know what the number one best episode of Teen Titans Go is, so let's get through the honorable mentions. Can't fade away, the way I feel for you, there ain't no word I can say, what I do for you in every single day, I make it through this game called life, it's always filled with pain and strife. So you're just gonna walk away? Yeah, I'ma walk away. If you were walking away, you'd be going further away, but you're not. Yeah, well look at you, just shifting up and down, side to side. You're the same size and proportion of my head. On the count of three, let's turn around and see if we're really walking away from each other. One, two, three! I knew you were walking away! Todos están haciendo sus propias cosas. Solos trabajando juntos puedes hacer algo bello. Mira! I understand! We should all work together! <laughs> Beast Boy. Yes? I think I want to make this thing work. You mean it? <laughs> <clears throat> the hamburger features a stackable structure which allows the user to customize it to one's individual taste. Its open-sided architecture provides a clear view of what's inside at all times. And because of its aerodynamically perfect design, many experts believe the burger to be a gift from a more highly advanced civilization from beyond the stars. In conclusion, they are good. Your parents must be worried sick. What? Aw, oh, don't be scared. We'll keep an eye on you until your mommy and daddy come pick you up. We don't need babysitters. We need to stop Mojo Jojo. And I need to do the pinches upon your widow cheeks. Hey, we are superheroes, not babies. Got it? I'm Buttercup, and that's Bubbles and Blossom. I mean, you know, some people prefer swords or, like, lasers, but I like to use this staff. See? Just crack, crack! Right on the head, the knee, crack, clavicle, whatever. <laughs> really gets the job done. You can't fade away. The way I feel for you, there ain't no word I can say. What I do for you in every single day. I make it through this game called life. It's always filled with pain and strife. 
My number one pick represents the most that Teen Titans Go wants to offer. It's very fun, it's very colorful, it's very wacky, it has a little bit of romance, it's full of action, it doesn't take itself seriously, it's random. All of the characters are at their best here. So, my number one pick is Colors of Raven, and let's check out why. We see that the Titans are about to face off with Dr. Light, but they can't just fight. They have to give witty one-liners. What Dr. Light is holding is much more important than him, which explains how short the fight lasts. Although we get some really disturbing implications with how Beast Boy and Cyborg were blasted into bits with no visual of their body, unlike Starfire, the heroes do prevail and capture Dr. Light, putting him in prison easily. They play around with the light prism, not the same light prism from my previous video, I swear it wasn't intentional, and the others misread her lack of emotion for extreme anger. You are at least excited about the butt kicking of the Dr. Light, yes? Was that excitement or your trademark use of the sarcasm? Starfire always assumes that Raven is using the sarcasm card. No, really. It happens again at the end of the episode. They keep playing with this light prism until it turns on. Not wanting to be the person holding it for whatever happens happening, Raven is the unlucky one, with the crystal absorbing her and turning her into five different aspects of her personality. We just split Raven into four versions of herself! Actually, there are five ravens now. Are you sure? Cause... Go ahead, Beast Boy. We'll wait. <sighs> zero, one, two... Wait, 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 wait. You don't start at zero when you count. Really? Huh. And five it is. One of my favorite jokes from the series. You have gray her timidity, red her anger, purple her passion, orange her laziness, and pink her happiness. You'll notice common themes surrounding these characters. Gray would either hide or puke, red would attack and yell at everything, purple would be all over Beast Boy, orange wouldn't do much, pink would generally be around Starfire, but later in the episode just be an overall ecstatic person. Robin would then accept them as five. Imagine what they'd do on the battlefield, right? Right? But the very next scene shows that this may not be the best idea. Number one, passion is really all over Beast Boy. It's in the background, but trust me, Beast Boy knows. But there's also this scene here. Time to watch everybody's favorite action movie. No! It's not everybody's favorite movie, just yours, jerk. Hey, do you think uh, you can maybe uh, probably uh, think about uh, maybe uh, taking that advice? Anger ends up punching Robin and Cyborg all the time in this episode, by the way. The core traits really don't make a good fighting team, but they go into battle anyway. But before that, we get more scenes of all of the Ravens interacting with the other Titans. The way Robin is smashed into the table with all of his teeth knocked out is something. Beast Boy is still relishing with this new passion Raven, and Robin gets a call about Monster of the Week number 462, and... The episode has a lot of different types of comedy, albeit because each raven does something different to aid in the comedy, but what really works for this episode is the story. I know for a comedic episode, it doesn't have to have multiple layers, but it is appreciated if the downer has anything to say about that. Colors of Raven has a very solid story, and what really made me put this as number one is the fact that when I watch it, I always find something new to enjoy about it. In fact, when writing this review, I notice that each raven has a different charm on their robe that's supposed to represent their core personality. The titans decide that the ravens are too much trouble. Angry raven acts as the leader of the ravens and they all retreat from the tower. So now it's basically a large game of trying to find all of the ravens as they scattered all over Jump City. They first go after timidity and I gotta give props to Terra because the inflections she did for all of the ravens are different which gives the raven character that much more depth. It's commendable to see, and I feel like it's just as commendable behind the scenes. They end up capturing Grey because plot. Although if she hid behind things all the time, it's weird that she'd switch and just become a general sad person. Remember many times you've seen Timid Raven, she's always hiding somewhere. She isn't the only person who had a pretty big expansion or change in character. We have Pink Raven, the happy one, which went from being a more subtle happy and generally around Star fire and kind of stuck to the side in terms of the story to a more present role in the second half of the episode
loud and a lot more chaotic with her magic. Mind you, the only thing she did pre-retreating was make pancakes move. It's just a giant shift that honestly could have been built up to more, but I'm not complaining too much. I'm definitely not going to complain about the scenes with Pink Raven because it seems like everyone just had fun at that part. There really isn't any explanation I can give besides Cyborg, Beast Boy, and Pink Raven went under the influence. They really made sure to make it hit home that Pink Raven is just happy with a capital smiley face. And I await everyone in the comments to pick at what I just said. They don't capture her right away I might add. The scene cuts over to Passionate Raven, the more purple one. She is doing a kissing booth and maybe having Beast Boy confront her like this wouldn't be a bad idea as he was shot down earlier. You could have just had Beast Boy see this and get jealous and capture her in the crystal. Because she's just passionate for anyone in general and not Beast Boy. It was just that no other guy entertained her advancements until now, when Robin waits in line. This is the closest anyone is going to get to a Raven-Robin romance, and just to be clear in the original, it's Starfire and Robin, not Robin and Raven. Let's be 100% honest. I'm also not so sure why Starfire was so hurried. Yeah, she probably wouldn't want to see it, but she doesn't look annoyed, she looks more nervous or not wanting Robin to kiss someone else. Pink ends up touching the light shard in Cyborg's pocket, and they realize that they were partying in garbage. Anger is pretty much a short fight that ends very quickly and orange is pretty short. They're all really similar. Thanks for making me whole again. Uh, you're being mean, aren't you? No, really. Thanks. I believe this is the sarcasm? Not everything is sarcasm. You know, you really must have had a short role in this script, and when they had to give you lines, they gave you these honestly unnecessary lines. They end up not understanding Raven. Although this entire time, you wonder if they don't understand her because of her personality or because of the monotone inflection in her voice and the fact that you can't see her face. But let's not worry ourselves with that because this was Colors of Raven. Overall, one of the most exciting episodes and a great concept that they even brought it back in a later episode. I like the interesting iterations of all the Ravens. I like the side relationship between them. I applaud Terra for making the effort to make them all sound different but still sound like Raven. They had fun and I had fun watching it. This script was about 21 pages long. It's probably going to be one of my longer videos if not my longest. I didn't make this to persuade everyone who didn't like Teen Titans Go to then take what I say as Bible about it but the fact that very little people, especially in our community, love to talk about Teen Titans Go really overlook underlook pass over these episodes, pretty much, when they're completely good. They've been slapped with a label that unfortunately sells more controversy or negativity. And like I said, I will still be reviewing Teen Titans Go whether positive or negative, but the key word there is whether positive or negative. I wanted to do this since April, really because it felt like something I wanted to do as a fan of the show, and someone needed to step up and actually bring forth some legitimacy that Teen Titans Go isn't as bad as people thought. I mean, personally, I know for a fact that if I did do the top 10 worst episodes of Teen Titans Go, a lot of the episodes you probably haven't seen reviewed would make up the majority of the list. So I made this as a way to inform you about good episodes, the best episodes of Teen Titans Go. I analyze these episodes for their story, not because it looks good, not because something something kids show. Teen Titans Go will probably never really recover and it's most likely on its way out very soon relatively. And who knows what era we'll be in when the next cash cow takes over. But here's one thing I do know, I'll be on this side laughing at the people who claim that childhood was ruined while YouTubers make bank profiting off of their blind hate. Thank you so much for watching this, I'm glad to have hit the milestone of 75 episode reviews. I always have a different mindset and style after each special. I think now I'd be on the fourth season, although calling it that would be a little bit of a misnomer, but informally it is a big change in my style. Season 1 being when I had no idea what I was going for, even though I still really, really don't know what I'm doing. Season 2 being after reviews 25 or 30, I had a more consistent style 
style. I took out my intro and changed a lot. Season 3 being after review 50, where things started to really pick up, which leads to now. Post review 75. I would say considering my thumbnail overhaul, my more knowledgeable taste on cartoons, and the community and what may go on behind it, both the community and animation as a whole, a few new series that came out, the new intro, the change in structure, I would say this is going to be the start of season 4. So again, major shout out to Teeves for the art that you see in the thumbnails, Damie for this amazing fan art, Shadow for his Teen Titans Go video, Martin for his video on the cartoon reviewing community, Twisted Dan's for his video on Billy and Mandy, Crimson Mayhem, for his Loud House video, and Gem Reviews for his Childhood Trauma video. I want to thank you all for helping me get here in one way or another. I'll be forever grateful for all of this, and I can't believe I've made it this far. So what do you think of these episodes? Would you watch them? Do you still believe it's bad because the show overall is bad? Easy way to get hearts is to answer these end questions in any of my videos in the comment section below. And while you're doing that, also, if you have any requests at all, make sure to go to this video Video here and leave a comment on what it is. Now that review 75 is out of the way, I will be trying to take more requests. If you really like this video, you should contrast this with the downfall of Teen Titans Go, my 50th special, or my Teen Titans Go playlist in general. Make sure to subscribe and feel free to consider my Patreon. I'm gonna give my voice a break. As always, Alpha out.